Hi folks, this is Jacob Grace, and you're listening to Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast and blog about perennial agroforestry. For this episode, I got to talk to another one of my coworkers who's doing cool stuff. I really do have a lot of them. Adam D'Angelo is the founder of Project Pawpaw, a crowdfunded plant breeding effort focused on North America's forgotten fruit, the pawpaw. Adam told me how he's been on a national tour, appearing at festivals, pawpaw festivals to be exact, and talked to tens of thousands of people about this elusive fruit with an avocado-like texture and a cult-like following. He also talks about why the pawpaw is a perfect candidate for plant breeding efforts, with just a few key traits preventing it from being easier to produce, and why he hopes that crowdfunded plant breeding can overcome some of the challenges that traditional plant breeding programs face with perennial crops. But first, he told me what he's been nerding out about when we recorded in March, making maple syrup. The way I like to kind of start these off is just by having people talk about something they've been nerding out about lately. So something I've gotten pretty into lately, and as usual, I'm like two years behind everybody else on this stuff. I've gotten really into the Wordle, like the New York Times phone app. Um, so that's been a big part of my last couple of weeks. And the, um, the fellow I just recently interviewed for a podcast episode, John Hendrickson, was telling me that he likes the Wordle so much that he wrote his own Excel document that could like generate his own <laughs> Wordles. <laughs> So after he gets the the normal one done, he can go in and like he has a bank of five letter words that will just like go in to the Excel talk and he can guess what they are. So I was kind of jealous of that. I might have to build my own Wordle generator. What is your uh, preferred Wordle start word? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. The the current one I'm going with is the word cries, C-R-I-E-S. Do you have a favorite? Uh, my, my girlfriend and I play Wordle every day, and uh, yeah. adieu is a good one. It, Ad, adieu, like bid adieu oh, to someone. Oh, adieu. Yeah, um, that hits a lot of vowels, but uh, sometimes I feel like it's unfair to start with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. No, I think I'm getting more and more systematic in my Wordling. I've, like, I've probably put a little too much thought into it <laughs> at this point, but it's very satisfying when you get it in just a couple of guesses. Um, Great. So what's something you've been nerding out about lately? So uh, very seasonal. It's um, Lately, I've been all in on maple sap and mm-hmm. maple syrup making. Uh, the sap has been flowing really strong, a little bit earlier than, uh, than usual due to the warm weather we've been having here in the upper Midwest. But uh, we tapped trees at my girlfriend's tree farm out in Richland Center and yeah. have been gathering lots of sap last weekend and this weekend. Uh, I'll be boiling. I just built a new boiler, which has been cool too. So I we really made it a lot more efficient, use a little bit less firewood, mm. make a little bit more syrup. Yeah. All good things. Yeah. Uh, I don't have much maple sugaring experience, but um, I'm from Missouri originally and my family would make molasses, which I think is a very similar process once you get the, get the juice out. But um, is yeah. Is that out of like sorghum? Yeah, yeah, it's out of sorghum, so we have a big press, and you run the, the canes, I guess, or uh, yeah, yeah, forget, that's I'm awesome. Forgetting the terminology, but I've always wanted to do that. Yeah. yeah, I don't like the taste as much as maple syrup, so <laughs> I think I need to switch over to team maple syrup. Um, yeah, okay, well, great. Um, so before we we get any farther, let's. Uh, give you a little time to introduce yourself here and this is fun because Adam and I are here in person at the Savannah Institute offices in Madison, Wisconsin but because part of working for a quickly growing organization is I don't actually know you that well we haven't really had a time to to just chat about things so we're doing this for the podcast but we're also kind of getting to know each other here so do you want to say a little bit about your background and what brought you to the Savannah Institute? Sure. I'm, uh, my name is Adam D'Angelo. I'm the breeding operations manager here at Savannah. Uh, and what that really consists of is me working very closely with the tree crop breeders on the tree crop improvement team. And uh, I am working to get plants in the field, working to take data on those plants. Uh, right now, as we're setting up these programs, I'm doing a lot of protocol development. So I'm working on the best ways to grow, plant, harvest, collect data on things. And then a side project is I'm working to 
decrease the generation time of the crops. That way, once we get things set up and start rolling, we can really start to make some progress with the breeding. And we can probably talk more about that later. Okay. But uh, yeah, I've always been a tree guy. Uh, I worked, uh, when I went to undergrad at Rutgers University, I worked in Dr. Molnar's hazelnut breeding lab. Worked there for four years. Went to grad school here at UW-Madison, and I worked with beets, actually, which is an interesting change of pace. Uh, beets, if people don't know, they have a two-year breeding cycle. They need to uh, grow their root the first year, winter over, then they'll flower the next year. So by most plant breeding standards, that's considered very slow. But coming to it from trees, I felt like it was lightning fast. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was great to work there. I was working on breeding beets for flavor and eating quality. So I got to work with uh, vegetables and, and people. It was nice to see a niche crop and learn how people used that, interacted with it, and how uh, breeders could make a better tasting and, and a better uh, for you, better eating quality vegetable yeah. as well. So combining those two things, we've got trees and breeding for people. And I'm really excited that Savannah Institute's given uh, me the chance to do both of those things. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I also spent some time at UW Madison and always wanted to work in the beat lab just because it sounded like a recording studio <laughs> or something. <laughs> but I'm sure you guys made a lot of jokes about that. We've actually had people send us uh, beat raps. Maybe I can oh. dig one up for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and I know that uh, a plant that is near and dear to your heart that we have not really mentioned yet is the pawpaw. So... Um, do you want to tell a little bit about how, how you first encountered pawpaws and, and how that's grown into a, a more mature and lasting relationship? <laughs> sure thing. Uh, I mean, maybe we should start. Uh, mm -hmm. Your listeners are probably pretty familiar with, uh, with the pawpaw, but in case they're not, uh -huh. uh, pawpaw is North America's largest native fruit, and it tastes like banana and mango, and it has the texture of a ripe avocado. So it's sort of a, a large, uh, maybe the size of a, size of a mango, and it has green skin, yellow flesh, uh, ten, five to ten large black seeds inside of it. And the flesh is super soft. It's, it's almost like a custard. Uh, and it grows all throughout the Northeast, uh, Midwest, South, Mid-Atlantic, uh, sort of the eastern side of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a native fruit. It's been growing here. It's been eaten by indigenous people for thousands of years. Uh, it's been an important part of uh, more modern American uh, society. It was George Washington's favorite fruit, fed the Lewis and Clark expedition. Hmm. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, wow. it's really entrenched in, in the culture of this place. Uh, but it's interesting that as we've shifted to a more modern food system, we don't see it as much. Uh, it just doesn't play well. And we can talk about that later. But I, I first encountered this tree when I was a kid visiting my brother. He was doing a summer internship and he showed me a pawpaw tree. And I was like, what's that? He's like, oh, it's, it's a fruit. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I know all the fruits. You got like <laughs> apples, bananas, like sometimes an orange, you know, pineapple if you're feeling fancy. But like I went, I remember going back to uh, to my room that night and, and looking it up and finding this whole world of, of fruits, pawpaws, persimmons, all sorts of other things that we have forgotten about, despite the fact that they grow right here. Yeah. And that was that was on my mind as I went through uh college then grad school i you know i really liked working with trees so i when i had that plant breeding experience with the hazelnuts that was awesome but it wasn't until uh probably about four years ago is when i started to realize that i could really do something with this i can take the plant breeding education that i have and apply this to pawpaws and kind of cross the last few milestones yeah. and uh, and help them get to more farmers and ultimately to more people yeah I, I love this story about you hearing about it being like, no, I know all the fruits and that's yeah. not one of them. <laughs> Cause I imagine that's how it is for a lot of people. And you said it's the largest native fruit in North America. It is. Yeah. Okay. It's botanically a berry actually. Really? Yes. Huh? So, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so kind of continuing on that thread, uh, tell us about Project Pawpaw and how this got started. Yeah, so Project Pawpaw is, is what actually came out of those thoughts. About four years ago, I started realizing that I'd like to uh, become a pawpaw breeder. I'd like to make new varieties of pawpaws that are a little bit better suited for, for today's market. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Project Pawpaw is a crowdfunded plant breeding and research program. It's funded entirely uh, by the people, for the people. It, we sell t-shirts and hats and seedlings and, and uh, grafting kits and all sorts of things like that. And all that money goes directly towards planting these research orchards. Uh, and that's, that's what I've been working on. We had a big public launch last year and I did a national tour and went all around and met with tens of thousands of people, went to the Pawpaw festivals and uh, it w was really uh, wonderfully surprised and encouraged by, by the support we've gotten. That's really cool. You said Pawpaw festivals, plural. I, there are multiple Pawpaw festivals around the country? There are, there are. Yeah. There's, we went to uh, North Carolina, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, there's some opening up in Illinois and Kentucky, they're all oh. over. And uh, there yeah. seems to be more and more springing up every year, mm -hmm. uh, which is just fantastic timing because I was going to do this uh, regardless, but to have been working on this project and then right as I'm getting ready to launch it, see this sort of explosion in pawpaws in, uh, in the media and, and in popularity, it's been, it's been really fantastic. Yeah. Are there any other crops that have this kind of like crowdfunded breeding effort behind them? I'm, I can't think of any other examples of that. So the best uh, that I can think of is there's a, a gentleman, I'm drawing a blank on his, uh, on his real name, but his username is Skill Cult, And you've actually had him on some of your uh, perennial farm gathering videos, I think. Okay. Uh, and he, he does apple breeding and it's mm. all funded off of Patreon and his online following. And okay. uh, seeing that was a, a great inspiration. It's, uh, and for a lot of reasons, you know, I think that's how a lot of these plant breeding programs end up having to be funded. And I think we'll see more of this as we go on, as our, our more traditional funding uh, structures make it harder for long, long-term research. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're gonna see more non-conventional funding structures like, like crowdfunding or, or you know, community supported breeding, huh. stuff like that. Yeah, community supported agriculture in a in a different way, yeah. a more <laughs> in a more research and development way. That's very interesting, and we should probably clarify: this was before you worked for the Savannah Institute. This is a completely separate thing that you yeah. conceived of and started on your own. Yeah, this has yeah. been been totally separate, and it's just been. Uh, it was fantastic that Savannah sort of came into this uh, position of being able to hire people for these other programs that align really well with my interests and uh yeah it's it's been a great fit yeah that's good um can you say a little bit about what what the savannah institute is doing with pawpaws if anything i know it's not a so we aren't working with pawpaws yeah. but uh we're working in a sim I'd, I'd say in a similar area we're, we're <laughs> working to breed new varieties of of trees we've got uh hazelnuts chestnuts mulberries persimmons black currants elderberry uh, and, and a whole, whole host of, of crops that we're breeding uh, for a lot of the same objectives. Mm -hmm. Better better fruiting qualities, uh, you know, better agronomic qualities, uh, tasting better, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, various uh, specific issues need to be tackled with each crop. But uh, it, it's just this idea of breeding less conventionally produced crops or, or more locally adopted, adapted crops. Mm -hmm. uh, for use in these agroforestry systems that I think is really powerful. Okay. Yeah. And so with all these perennial crops out there, why did you choose to focus on pawpaws? That's a good question. I, I think a lot of it is that uh, the pawpaw just seems to be a very charismatic fruit. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen one, they're, they're kind of cute. They definitely draw your attention. Uh, it's super tropical tasting in, in both uh, texture and, and flavor, you can't believe it grows here. And, and it's the only member of its family that does grow here. Uh, it kind of got stuck up here when the continents divided. It's wow. uh, the other members of this family are soursop, cherry moya, uh, custard apples down in South America. So mm -hmm. it's this incredibly tropical fruit. Uh, it, it tastes great already. People love it. It grows really well here. It doesn't need uh, a lot of inputs. It's, it's not particularly dependent upon fertilizer, pesticide, uh, it can handle on its own. So, it, and it has this fantastic uh, cult following, you know, at, <laughs> at, these, at these festivals, you, you, you think they're small, but the Ohio Pawpaw Festival can have 13,000 people come to it. Wow. Uh, so 
on this road trip, I got to meet with literally tens of thousands of people who uh -huh. were excited about this fruit. Uh, and I also got to see some of the challenges facing the traditional uh, programs that are working on this. We have Kentucky State University and some of the other uh, college institutions are working on it, but you can see that they're, they're underfunded, overworked, uh, and we're not trying to like displace them. We're trying to work along with them. Yeah. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, along with that, we can talk about there's, there's, there are some shortcomings with pawpaws, too, that uh, really present a clear opportunity for plant breeding. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's why this is a good candidate, because there's just a few objectives or if we can accomplish that, we can really have a great fruit for people. OK. We're going to paw, paw, pause this conversation with Adam D'Angelo. I'm so sorry. This is what you get for listening to a podcast called Perennial AF. This podcast is made possible by the Grassland 2.0 Project. If you follow them on social media, you'll know that they've been highlighting different people working with the project, like Brooke Bembenek, whose Grassland 2.0 journey began as a graduate student in agroecology with Dr. Randy Jackson. Today, she's a conservation grazing analyst in Marathon County, helping expand dairy heifer grazing. Brooke says, we are building a movement. I'm thankful that Grassland 2.0 exists because we're making space for conversations that likely wouldn't be happening otherwise. You can learn more about Grassland 2.0 at grasslandag.org. Perennial AF is also sponsored by Canopy, a perennial farm management business and tree crop nursery based in Illinois and Wisconsin. Over the last month, we Savannah Institute folks have had a chance to test out the new Canopy Compass tools that are in development. And it's been eye-opening to look through their data and their maps and visualize what agroforestry could actually look like in some of the places that I'm familiar with. The Canopy Compass tools are coming out soon, and in the meantime, you can learn more about Canopy's products and services at canopyfm.com. Now we'll get back to my conversation with Adam D'Angelo and hear him answer some commonly asked questions about pawpaw production. Like, what do we know about the pawpaw population? <laughs> okay, that was the last one. Yeah, so thinking about pawpaws and the cult following that they have, um, what, are, what are some of the most commonly asked questions that you get from people about pawpaws? Well, beyond the typical what is a pawpaw? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, if people know about them or, or they are interested in them, uh, often people want to know where they can grow or where do they grow. Uh, they do grow all throughout those areas I was talking about before, which is Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, South, um, and Southeast. But the uh, where can they grow is actually a bit different. So we generally say zones five to eight they do really well in, although uh, Buzz Fervor, who's a friend of Savannah Institute, we he, we see him growing pawpaws in northern Vermont, zone 4A. Hmm. There's people growing pawpaws in Canada. So cold hardiness doesn't really seem to be the issue uh, in terms that they don't die uh, if it gets very cold. What you will see is that the fruit might not have time to ripen or a late freeze hmm. might take off the flowers in the spring. So cold environment pawpaws may not consistently fruit every year, but some years you probably will get fruit. And if you can plant early ripening varieties, you increase your chance of getting uh, a good yield in northern climates. In the south, you actually have uh, bigger issues. If you go down to Florida, the trees don't seem to get enough chilling, so they actually, they really don't seem to survive that well. But luckily there are a few other Asimina species uh, in Florida. They produce lower quality fruit, but they are adapted for that environment. Okay. Um... Sorry, I lost track of where we were. <laughs> I was having trouble with my microphone. Um, so that we were on where can pawpaws grow? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, what about shade? Can Where do pawpaws like to grow in terms of full sun, low sun? How does that work? Yeah. So pawpaws like well-drained, fertile soil, and uh, a common misconception is that they need shade. And that comes from the fact that when people find them growing in the woods, they're often growing in the shade. Mm. Uh, but if you kind of break that down and look at it, what you're really seeing is a plant that is a master of tolerating shade. So these pawpaw trees, they, they'll grow 
at the base of a forest uh, in, in heavy shade, and they often uh, will just hang out there. You can find a 10-year-old pawpaw tree that's maybe up to your chest or something. It's, it's just waiting until a tree above it falls and opens up a hole in that canopy, and then it will grow really quickly to try and capture that space. So it'll get tall, and then it will start to fruit. So mm -hmm. when we establish pawpaws, we, uh, I prefer to put them into tree tubes for the first year. So that's sort of giving them that, uh, giving a little protection from the wind and the cold in the winter, but also giving them a little bit of shade in the summer to simulate them growing at the base of a forest. And then after one year, after the trees are established, you take that tube off, they've got their roots all set, and they're ready to uh, capture that sunlight. And they get big and they start to fruit. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um... And then another question people might have, um, like I have this question is where could I buy myself a pawpaw to eat or find, find the fruit to eat? Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest challenge with pawpaws is that they have a very short shelf life. It can be days or a week. If you happen to get the fruit at the correct stage of ripeness and get it right into a refrigerator, you can uh, maybe extend that to two weeks. Hmm. But it's super difficult for a farmer to get fruit even to a farmer's market and then for it to get mm -hmm. home to a person. Uh, so right now your best chance is a farmer's market. It's going to be very rare. You see them in the grocery store. Um, and as for plants, we're starting to see a lot of nurseries get into growing pawpaws. Uh, there's, there's pawpaw seedlings maybe at your local nursery. Uh, and if you're having trouble finding them, uh, there's plenty of online nurseries. And a, a bit of a self-plug is Project Papa also sells uh, <laughs> seedling plants and will have grafted trees this fall okay. uh, for sale on our website. Yeah. Tell me about the grafted plants. Do you have recommendations for grafted versus non? So it, it's about uh, your risk preference, I think. A grafted tree is a, a cloned tree, essentially. So if you get a named variety of pawpaw that makes excellent quality fruit, you can graft that onto other rootstock to uh, have a tree that will make that same high quality fruit. Uh, typically grafted trees are more expensive, maybe double or three times the price of a just a seedling grown tree. So if you feel confident that you can establish a tree well and you can take care of it, then grafted plants are great. They'll even fruit a little bit faster. But if you're worried about your ability to establish the tree, I generally recommend that people plant seedling trees in their yard or mm -hmm. at their farm. And then once they've been able to get that established, maybe two or three years after they planted it, you can come back and you can graft onto the top of that whatever variety you want. Uh, mm. And I think that's probably a, a better way to scale this as people start to invest in pawpaw orchards. Uh, they might want to go in the route of buying a lower cost seedling tree just to minimize some of the risk. Okay, great. Um, this is going to be a sidebar, but on the buying the fruit, I know last year I was at a conference where... Um, Tom Wall from Redfern Farm was talking to me about freeze drying pawpaw. Do you have any experience with freeze drying pawpaw? <laughs> so generally the ways that you want to extend your pawpaw shelf life, freezing the fruit uh, like, or freezing the pulp is the best way. Uh, people have found had issues with uh, dehydrating. So if you make like a fruit leather out of pawpaw, uh, it will make you sick. And mm. there's multiple theories as to why that is. Uh, it's kind of a fatty fruit, so some people are thinking the fats are going rancid in it. Oh. So uh, I remember Tom Wall, his idea was that the freeze drying, since you're not heating it up for that prolonged period, it shouldn't make anything go rancid. So if you don't mm. let the fruit, the pulp oxidize and you put it right in the freeze dryer and, uh, and dry it out, then uh, you should have something that wouldn't make you sick. I think yeah. he tried that. Um, I'm not he sure. He gave me some to eat, so How did it make <laughs> maybe he was testing it out on me. <laughs> uh, it, it, I only had a little bit, but it tasted fine. Yeah. That's the thing he was worried about was storage methods that retain the flavor, because mm -hmm. I guess that's maybe what you're saying with, the, with dehydrating it, too, is that um, it's hard to store it and not lose the flavor, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think he's still figuring out his methods to uh, make sure that it it stays good for people to eat. Okay. Yeah. Because the other thing he said was that uh, it gets so light that if you're selling it by the pound, the price to make it oh, worth yeah. it just gets <laughs> kind of alarming to people <laughs> when you tell them the price per pound. But it's just this, you know, lighter than air stuff. But anyway, that's a side note that <laughs> I was curious if you had experience with. Yeah, I tried to buy some from him this year, but he sold out oh, instantly. Okay. Yeah. 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 
that doesn't surprise me. Um, okay, well, let's talk about, uh, I'm sure if people are interested in pawpaws and they start Googling pawpaw, growing it, processing it, sooner or later they're going to come across uh, questions or concerns around neurotoxicity, which is a scary word to read about <laughs> something you're eating or growing for other people to eat. So, Adam, what's the story with neurotoxicity and pawpaws? Yeah, so when people are talking about neurotoxicity, they're really talking about uh a class of compounds called acetogenins. Now, those are found in pawpaws, but also in avocado, soursop, graviola, and a whole host of other uh, food species around the world. Uh, specifically, we're talking about ananaceous acetogenins, which are the ones that are found in, in pawpaw and the anona family. And uh, the concerns come from a series of studies uh, where people were experiencing uh, early onset Parkinsonism uh, when eating a diet uh, that was filled with soursop leaf tea. Uh, but that was, mm. those studies really came from kind of a small sample size, and those people were consuming this leaf tea every day, uh, and you know, they were isolated populations. Uh, that being said, it, it is something that we're concerned about. Uh, we, we've, or people have done research and seen that uh, acetogens have generally a low bioavailability in humans. So they were actually looking at it as an anti-tumor compound for mm -hmm. cancer treatment. And one of the reasons that was hindered is that they were having trouble actually getting it to absorb into the human tissue. It was passing through uh, too easily. Hmm. Uh, but still, uh, despite the fact that there's really not strong evidence that it uh, has negative health effects, uh, we do recommend that you just like everything else you enjoy it in moderation uh -huh. you know uh too much candy is not good too many persimmons can you know mess up your stomach uh <laughs> so with the seasonal nature of pawpaws of how sort of a period they're available uh, mm -hmm. you know seasonally you would really struggle to eat enough to have any negative health effects but okay. nonetheless it does uh make it a great target for a plant breeding program because mm -hmm. we can select for pawpaw varieties with lower levels of acetogenins and we've done that you know humans have a long history of domesticating their foods to not have toxins like, like cassava lima beans almonds and uh, even elderberries they all contain cyanide precursors uh, before they were domesticated potatoes and tomatoes had alkaloids spinach cacao tea rhubarb they have oxalic acid and and like cabbage broccoli kale all the brassica have glucosinolates so you know humans have long been finding plants that taste great but have a couple of things wrong and then mm -hmm. selecting ones uh, that are more edible or better for us and okay. i think we can do the same with pawpaws great yeah the message there is not to just not eat any foods at all because <laughs> no no <laughs> eat foods eat it all in moderation yeah yep yep yeah sounds good um then let's talk about some of the the challenges you mentioned with with raising crops like pawpaws or any of these long-lived perennial crops so what are some of the the big targets for a breeding program yeah so the targets for project pawpaws breeding program are primarily shelf life and acetogenin uh, ultimately we want to make sure that we produce a, uh, a suite of cultivars of pawpaws that still taste great still grow well uh, but they just have a longer shelf life so that farmers can more effectively grow and market their fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do it. We have a three stage approach. We do a research on the best way to grow, harvest and store, because a lot of this stuff can just be done through practices. Mm -hmm. uh, we do breeding to make these new varieties. And we're also going to be doing market development to help make sure that farmers have a path from tree to table for their fruit. Yeah. Uh, but in general, you know, the reason that we're even doing this sort of crowdfunding approach is that there's a few key challenges that have kind of led to a loss of tree breeding, specifically fruit and nut tree breeding programs in the U.S. Uh, you know, one of them is generation time is that the it takes so long. It can take five to seven years to go from seed to seed in a pawpaw. And a lot of these other crops have similar time spans, which means that in your lifetime, you know, you may only get a handful of generations for something like pecans, where you have maybe a 15 year generation time, you know, it, mm. that can be your whole lifetime working on that. And mm. then you're always standing on the giant shoulders of giants working off of what people before you have, have done. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's slowed it down. Uh, 
building a market, I think that's something that we really experience in Savannah as well. And luckily, you guys have built a fantastic team. We've got economists and supply chain management people working to make sure that once we get these crops to farmers, they can actually sell them and that the people who are buying these crops can make them into products and that consumers know how to consume them and mm -hmm. where they can get them and they can get them at an affordable rate. So yeah. I really admire that SI is doing a fantastic job of building that value chain. Well, and that includes you now too. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nicely done. And then, you know, I think the third challenge, so you've got generation time, you've got uh, building a market and the funding is seriously an issue. And it has been an issue as, as we've seen uh, federal dollars move towards uh, needing quick returns and, uh, you know, short term deliverables. When you have a generation time of, of five years, it's really hard to get grant funding for something that may take you 15 to 20 years to release a new variety, uh, which is why we've seen, you know, Savannah's exploring. Uh, we've got our independent fundraising. We've got, uh, you know, some some good large investment from people who want to see this succeed. But yeah. without that, to kickstart it, it's really tough. Mm -hmm. and, and the crowdfunding is just a different way of doing that. Uh, it's, it's very decentralized, small bits here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just think we're going to see more and more these alternative ways of breeding plants and coming up with money for research programs like this uh, as we sort of realize that we need them. We mm -hmm. need the work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Talking with John Hendrickson for one of the recent episodes, he was talking about the financials of perennial farming and how you kind of dig yourself into this hole and then trying to figure out when you come out and it sounds kind of similar with research and breeding efforts too is like there's going to be this stretch of years where you're not getting anything you're mm -hmm. just the money is disappearing and <laughs> it's going to be a long time before you start getting the things that you're hoping to you get so that's that can be tough to fund i can i could picture that um Okay, I think we've made it through uh, a lot of the initial questions we had here, and I'm, I, I'm just curious about a lot of the work you're doing, so I might throw out a couple other things. Sure. Uh, I guess the one of the things that came to mind is, as you're doing all this work with pawpaws, where, uh, where are you finding the different varieties that you're working with? Yeah, so honestly, the first challenge we've had is assembling what is already out there. You know, there's maybe a hundred pawpaw varieties, but they've never been planted in the same place. Uh, no one has them side by side. So okay. it's very difficult to compare uh, what's what's good and where. So that's been our first task. And then as we start to make our first generation of crosses between really good parents, we need to plant them out. So in just a few weeks, actually, we'll be establishing our first uh, Project Pawpaw Breeding Orchard. Mm -hmm. That's in southern New Jersey. Okay. Actually, we have a farmer collaborator who's got great ground nice and flat uh, good warm weather uh, and the nice thing about that is it's isolated from natural populations so mm -hmm. uh, since a lot of that land has been cleared there aren't any wild stands so we can keep that really clean make sure there's no disease that gets into it uh, so once our trees are big enough we can start sending scion wood out to other people collaborators mm -hmm. uh, farmers who are interested in grafting things like that okay yeah. yeah and i guess since it grows wild there's kind of an unlimited number of varieties right yeah so there's been a few generations of selection uh you know starting 100 200 years ago people have picked the best ones they found in the woods and and mm -hmm. crossed between them uh but i'm certain that there's fantastic fruit out in the woods so if any of you out there listening in radio land have uh <laughs> have encountered a fantastic pop on the woods let us know send us some seeds or some scion wood and uh, we can test it alongside the other stuff and maybe it has the uh, potential to be the next great pawpaw variety. Yeah, send it express. <laughs> Gotta get it here quick, because I wanna try one. <laughs> no, I've had one before, but uh, yeah. What, what is the best way? Are, are you like sharing the seeds with people or cuttings or how do, how do you share the plant material? Yeah, so I think the ultimate goal will be to release some varieties that'll probably be sold as uh, scion wood or pre-grafted plants. Okay. That's really the only way to distribute uh, actual actual named varieties. But we do sell seeds mm -hmm. uh, that are just select seeds from great parents. There's okay. no guarantee of what those seeds will produce. But since they both had uh, both parents had great genetics and really good fruit quality, uh, they're 
are more likely to produce fruit with good quality. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what our seedlings are and our, our seeds are. But um, yeah, in the future years, we should be having cyan wood to distribute as well. Okay, excellent. Um, the other question I had, and I don't know if we want to get into this or not, but I know you've done some pretty extensive communications and outreach with uh, plant breeding and and stuff like Project Papa in the past. So are you still doing a lot on social media or out there in the world? Or? <laughs> it's seasonal, you know, yeah. as you as you know, Jacob, it uh -huh. is a lot of work um, to make to make content and to do it consistently. So uh, the I try to just do it really badly. It's, <laughs> it's easy to churn it out when you're when you're pretty low quality. <laughs> I think it's high quality stuff, man. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, there will be more content uh, in Paw Paw season. We're gonna be showing some uh, posts and videos of us planting these orchards okay. and some how tos for grafting and stuff yeah. like that. Um, so, so where can people find that? Yeah, online. So you can tune in uh, at we have Instagram at Project Paw Paw. Uh, we have a Project Paw Paw Facebook group. We have TikTok, uh, and then you can always go to project pawpaw that's project p a w p a w dot com and there you can find updates uh we have informational guides on how to plant grow graft we've got our shop where you can buy any uh any merch and all the sales from that uh grafting kits shirts hats seedlings etc all those proceeds go directly to fund the uh orchard establishment okay um, yeah and you can always sign up yeah. for our email list too and we'll send out one email a year. We will not spam you. <laughs> <laughs> Just like uh, plant breeding, you get to do it once a year, and yeah. then, <laughs> or even less, <laughs> even less for perennial crops. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, anything else you want to make sure is included here before we go to the final? Would you rather's? I think we nailed it. Yeah. Okay. That was good. I've I've made it this far without making a joke about paw paw podcasting. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can slip it in there. Yeah, yeah. It, it may uh, it may end up in the introduction. But um, yeah, before you go, Adam, I like to ask people some agroforestry would you rather's, and I'm trying to incorporate some new ones here. So we'll see how this goes. Um, first off, would you rather raise goats, pigs, or turkeys? Have you raised any of those in the past? I have raised turkeys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I I would choose turkeys. Uh, they're they're kind of challenging, you know, they're, uh, they're big and strong and, and kind of smelly, but, uh, I, I did, it was really nice having a Thanksgiving turkey that you had, had raised mm. and, and processed yeah. and all of that. And I think it's also nice that you could do turkeys once a year. You could, you could mm. do a batch of turkeys for Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, uh, I, I like the seasonal aspect of that. Yeah. That makes me wonder about, um, livestock and pawpaws uh, do they work well together are people silver pasturing under pawpaws they are so uh chris camille in, at integration acres in ohio he raises his goats under pawpaw trees and the goats don't eat the pawpaws uh, okay because they don't like the flavor of the leaves hmm. and uh that seems to be a fantastic system for him wow that's good to know um okay would you rather have 100 acres of bare ground or 10 acres of mature agroforestry oh, so you sent me this question ahead of time and uh -huh. i have been thinking about it for a long time <laughs> and i think my best answer is i would like to have 100 acres of bare ground if it was next to someone with 10 acres of mature because i'd want to work with the person who has the mature system uh -huh. that way i can uh, learn from them and and avoid some of the pitfalls that they've encountered because 100 yeah. acres is a lot of space and I, it's really tough to just jump into that without uh talking to someone who's done it before yeah i like that thinking beyond the boundaries of your own farm and who's going to be around because i think that's what makes or breaks a lot of mm -hmm. operations um next up would you rather farm without electricity or farm without plumbing <gasps> So a clarifying question here, uh, can I have solar panels? And does no plumbing mean that there's no irrigation? I'm gonna say you cannot generate your own electricity. Okay. Um, uh, but you could dig your own irrigation. 
Okay, so you you could install irrigation, but yeah, no no pipes, no PVC, no. Hmm. Yeah. I guess I'd have to say, oh, that's a really tough question, Jacob. I think I'd have to say no electricity, just because uh, having water is essential, especially you get one drought year and you could lose lose something you've been working on for a long time. Yeah. Yep. I think that's true. Okay. Uh, all right. And then uh, <laughs> always my favorite question, would you rather work with someone who doesn't know what they're doing or someone who is always grouchy? Uh, if the person who doesn't know what they're doing is, has a positive outlook and wants to learn, okay. I love that. You know, blank yeah. slates are awesome. Uh, often people who have been doing it for a long time may not be willing to change or, you know, they, and they have yeah. great valuable experience, but, uh, yeah. sometimes it's really nice to work with someone who is a sponge. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Usually if people don't know what they're doing, usually they haven't been doing it for a long time, but we get surprised by how, <laughs> how long some people have been persisting despite not knowing what they're doing. So I think that's a good answer. Um, all right. Well, Adam D'Angelo, thank you so much for being on the podcast here with us. And um, people can stay tuned with your work if they're interested in pawpaws. And we'll be hearing more from you because you're here at the Savannah Institute. So thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jacob. That was Adam D'Angelo talking with me about North America's most elusive fruit. You can learn more about Project Pawpaw at projectpawpaw.com and follow along on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you have any pawpaw varieties that you think Project Pawpaw should know about, send them to Adam. Don't send them to me. I will not know what to do with them. As Adam mentioned, the Savannah Institute research team is not currently doing any plant breeding work with pawpaws, but we are working with some other promising native fruits for our region, like elderberries. Here's Eliza Greenman and Scott Brainerd to tell us more. Our next crop is American elderberry. So American elderberry is a native uh, small fruit shrub crop that grows really well across the upper Midwest. And so a Sambucus candidensis. And this is really exciting um, in that we're, we're sort of in this new sector of um, in that all the sp- all the cultivars that are in the United States right now are wild. Not only is it native here, and so it, it, it uh, already thrives in this environment, but in addition, uh, it fruits on first year wood. And so um, this makes the cultivation of American elderberry uh, amenable to an annual coppice regime where you would be completely mowing down the above ground biomass every year or every couple years and that plant will bounce right back and fruit the following year. The thing about American elderberry is that it can be annually coppiced and so that helps majorly in controlling pest and pest pressure like stem borers and such. They can get cut out and ground and uh, we in the next year you know we start anew. In addition to that it has a very high value fruit that's in increasingly high demand and it has an important characteristic uh, that makes it distinct from European elderberry which is that uh, it has a very low level of cyanogenic glycosides which are a toxin that requires that a a European elderberry be heat treated before the uh, juice is sold for consumption. Whereas American elderberry can be cold pressed. Also, the berries have a low glycoside content, uh, whereas European berries have to have heat applied to them usually in order to have them be pressed as juice and ours in the United States can just be pressed and drank and there's not a whole lot of fear. Um, there's also, there, there's a huge growing demand for them. And uh, yeah, we just got to plant more. Not only does it fruit on first year wood, um, and that has advantages from a sort of agronomic production perspective, it also makes it a lot easier to breed because it flowers very rapidly and you're able to get uh, performance data off of that plant within one, two years. So while for some of the uh, nut crops or tree crops, we're waiting 
multiple years before we're really able to make any sort of decision or progress in the program with uh, elderberry that uh, that that rate of advancement within the program will be a lot more rapid so our breeding targets are basically just to you know have the largest fruit set we can get off of an annually coppice bush cold hardiness of course down to zone four um high yields and then for uniform ripening you know machine harvesting we just need to be able to harvest the stuff in one pass so it holds on to the the berries hold on enough to get machine harvested and they knock off easily and they all ripen at the same time so the major set of traits that we are trying to improve with american elderberry is its machine harvestability right now american elderberry is primarily harvested by hand so that's a lot of uh, manual labor that is really limiting its adoption at scale and solving that problem it requires some advancements in ag engineering just building harvesters that can harvest american elderberry when grown as a hedgerow but it also requires breeding varieties that can be machine harvested and that involves uh, selecting for and paying attention to uh, a number of sort of interrelated traits the first is uniform ripening and that means uniform ripening across an entire bush you want a uh, ideally you know you want a flush of growth that all ripens at the same time so you're not making multiple passes with a harvester and you also want the uh, the, the flower the flower clusters to ripen uniformly across the cluster so that you know there haven't been some berries that have already fallen off and some green berries in the cluster that you know you just can't get off the bush or you know, aren't ripe yet um, you also want the berries to detach well from the uh, from the cluster itself, that they de-stem well without puncturing that flesh, and you want a firm berry in general that can be you know, shaken off or in some other way removed from the bush without damaging the fruit. Um, so that's a whole sort of suite of traits that we'll be able to evaluate again on this sort of single plant basis and um, also by combining the measurement of those individual traits with just an evaluation of running a harvester over the bush and seeing are we able to get all the berries off in a relatively unblemished way um, we'll hopefully be able to create some varieties pretty quickly that can be uh, grown up at scale the other sort of nice thing about elderberry that we'll be able to uh, use in, in the evaluation of this trait is it's very easy to propagate from cuttings so we can go from evaluating a single plant in the field to evaluating an entire row of a given variety and using that to simulate you know what it would actually look like on a farm running over an entire uh, plot of a, of a specific genotype that was scott brainerd and eliza greenman who work with Adam D'Angelo on perennial plant breeding at the Savannah Institute. If you have something you'd like to hear on this podcast, or a question you'd like to ask, or a story you'd like to tell, please let me know. You can leave us a voicemail at 608-448-6432, or send us a message on social media at Savannah Institute, and it'll find its way to me. And I know I've made some bad pawpaw jokes in this episode, so... I just want to take a minute to apologize for that. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you want to get our newest episodes when they come out, and I don't know why you would, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you're really feeling inspired and want to help us out, you can rate this podcast and write a review. It only takes a second, and it really helps this podcast get heard by more people. That's it for me. Until next time. Keep up the good work, keep your feet on the ground, and keep an eye on the sky.